Welcome back to one of the craziest indie fantasy series that I have read in quite a while. My name is Sean and today we're going to be covering War Mage Spellmonger Book 2. So about three months ago I made a video back in October about why I think you should read the Spellmonger series and in there I said that I would eventually be getting back into the series doing a full reread bringing it back to you and here we are. To give you guys an overview of what this video is going to be about, I'm going to start out with an outline of this book where we left off, give my spoiler free thoughts on the, the book and how it ties into the series, get into the book spoiler specifically, mainly just some things that I thought was really done well, and lastly I want to go into how I think this book ties into the series as a whole. As of making this video, I have read up to book 14, so I haven't read the newest one and I haven't read some of the side series, but trying to separate out so if you are starting this series based on my recommendation or even just picking up the series for the first time anyway then I don't want to just completely ruin some major or minor things for your experience. War Mage picks up right off the heels of Spellmonger. We are following one Baker Sarn turned wizard turned War Mage as he has just inherited a huge mess. Our main character Mindelin has managed to survive a goblin horde that is being led by a goblin skull that has been enveloped in a godlike power whose sole purpose is to go out and completely exterminate the human race in complete revenge and will do anything possible to actually achieve that with great discrimination. Menelin, after escaping that giant horde using trickery, magic stones, a cadre of war mages, and you know a little bit of sex magic and a quick rescue by what is essentially an alien race, now finds himself having to go and convey this story to the dukes and lords of this land. He has to convince not only of the existential threat of Sharul, who is a literal floating skull wrapped around in a magical crystal that absurdly amplifies his powers, but in even order to mount a credible defense against them, they're going to have to use all of the Duke's resources, their men, we're going to have to break their tradition and basically do anything they can possibly do just to hold on to humanity's survival. Getting into my spoiler free thoughts about this, I will say one thing having read the series before is that Terry Mancor is really great at leaving you on these cliffhangers or like, oh, what's going to happen next? and set up pieces in such a way that you're so invested in just how it's going to unfold out that you're just driven into read the next book after the next book. I think the first time I really got into the series is when I started getting through these books and just seeing that, oh, all these pieces have been laid out, we've just completely changed how the entire politics are going to play, and then you just see like what you can actually do with it and watching rapid expansion happen and everything that will happen in the future of the plot, it's very exciting and very engaging. But my general thoughts is if that you like the first book, you will love the second book. Terry Mancor, I think he was pretty solidified in his writing skill going into the first book, so there's not like a big jump in quality. I think the main difference between like the first book and this book is that now you've had some time to establish the world, give you enough exposition to understand the stakes, what's happening, how the magic works, what the other players are, and you're starting to expand out from just the base, like, hey, here's the reason why we should even care about this, and just will continuously build and build and build. And this book does a great job of setting the seeds for that built later building. Now, if you did not like the first book for how he handles exposition, or maybe you're uncomfortable with how he actually did some of the sexual aspects of this book, then while the sexual side of this isn't as like blatant as the first one, they still treat it like a pretty adult fantasy. So if that's something that makes you uncomfortable or you prefer the warm embrace of Brandon Sanderson and his ability to just fade to black and not include that stuff, then this book is gonna continue down that trend. So just fair warning, if you didn't like his writing style or just how he handled certain themes, then you're probably not gonna like the series. But if you were on the fence of it, if you just merely thought it was okay, you enjoyed it, or you liked the writing, and maybe you just thought that it just wasn't fast paced enough, then you should definitely check out this book because I think it starts picking up the pace and taking it to that next level. Where this series, I think, shines as a whole is that you continuously build on the last book. And if you like progression fantasy or how things expand out and out and out and characters gain power and political intrigue, then this book really sets the seeds for it. And having read it and going back through this book, you can see just how a lot of this shines early on. Now, having read some of the later books, I will say in comparison, 
that the craziness of this book, it's a good book, it's enjoyable, but if you compare it to when you start getting to like books 10 through 14 or even later on, I don't think it's quite at that same level, but I also don't think we've had enough time to really build up what the plot, the stakes are of the different factions that play. And it would honestly be way too much in a single book to actually explain it. I guess like the nearest thing I can think of is how Malazan just throws you in running and then you just eventually figure things out. Terry does, I think, a smoother job of where, you know, you know the world's going to be really big and it expands into something truly expansive, but you're getting eased into everything. So you're getting little hints in this book about what's gonna happen next for some of the players or by the time it actually gets to just the sheer absurdity of how big the plot is you know you're not lost you are getting accustomed and things just continuously build one upon each other to something really cool but having even read this series you know a couple times and getting back into this I was still pretty engaged with it which is a pretty high compliment I know certain books I'll come back and reread and when you lose that mystery or you know what's going to happen in the book series that will take a lot of like the finish off of a book and then it just has to rely on what the skill of the writing is and how much you enjoy the characters and coming back into this I had a pretty good time reading it so if you have read the first book and are considering the second one then I would say definitely dive into it we haven't gotten into the absurd craziness that I think make this series special yet but it's a good read. So to get into some specific spoilers about the book itself, I wanted to first talk about how the book was laid out. So we start out with Menelin at the head of the army, and I'd say about a third of the book just deals with him already having all the political power, already having the army gathered, and directly combating against the goblins themselves. You have the flashbacks of how he even got that power, of him having to try to navigate the politics and the court and how the hell do you actually convince a duke to give you to give all of his soldiers to someone who's not a noble is a mage not only a mage a baker's son and say hey you're going to be in charge of the success or failure of this incursion against the goblin invasion and then lastly once you kind of get the two points to actually converge you have the last letter of the book which is basically just all out action you're seeing just Menelin finally stride into his own and just have a really cool epic battle scenes that include him fighting dragons, him doing some crazy shit with magic, having to directly face off against Shrew once more, and just finishes it off with some like very nice like political intrigue. I like how a lot of this was set up because you start out with and you're not slogging through just all the political things, but you know in the very beginning Menelin has like an army he managed to convince everybody and you have that action interspersed where he's kind of out of his depth trying to figure out how to even like face off against this invasion. But while that's happening, you keep going back and forth between, you know, him trying to survive in court politics. And what I really liked was it wasn't just, hey, guys, I just showed up from over there and you guys should totally believe me that there's a goblin invasion coming and you have to give me all the power and relax these like century old bands against magic and just do exactly what I say because I'm the main character and I can lead us to safety. Instead, you got to see him embroiled in court, have to fight that intrigue and honestly see him not win the best head bit. At the end of this, you know, he may have gotten what he wanted, but having the Duchess and the Duke just use him for their own political gains and just absolutely go well past him because he's still a novice at court and then just see just the level of out of depth he actually is, especially with him trying to found a new order where they can't even settle on like a good name. It's, it was really good. Like I was happy they didn't just like, all right, here's the army, there you go. And instead we're seeing him trying to grow and adapt to the situation. You know, a lot of fantasy books will really excel in the action part. And I think that this book did a very good job at, you know, setting up the war, having you invested, not having you too drowned out in the details. Like it was fine book for action, but I haven't seen as many books able to handle the actual part, which is the political intrigue and make it seem like a realistic sort of thing. Like a lot of times it just seems like Characters get railroaded into having the best possible outcome just because they're the main character. And while Menelin does get everything that he wanted to get out of this, it felt very real and very earned. So him constantly being like out of his depth and kind of on the back foot while he's going through that, he's facing off, you know, General Hotarian with the censorate, scared shitless, even though he's probably the most powerful war mage at the time, just because he has Eero Knight and everyone else doesn't. <laughs> being scared shitless of the Duchess, who just happens to run the Ducal Kingdom's assassin network, and just realizing how out of the depth he was with her, and just, you know, the amount of power some of these people are used to dealing with. He had no idea, never had to deal with court, and to watch him go from like, oh shit, what do I do, to towards the end where he's like, okay, these are just people, I'm going to treat them like I would 
any other spellmonger situation. And then it's like, this is just like a peasant haggling for this. You know, how would I handle this if it was just a wart nose peasant trying to haggle for this? And finding that situation to work, I thought was very well done. The other things I really enjoyed about this was how they handled like the wartime camaraderie. The running joke where they can't figure out how to name the actual order and everyone gets like excited about a name and tries to like pitch it but then when everyone shoots it down you can see them getting a little butthurt about it. It's like these little small details I think are what carry the series in a lot of ways. Even the opening segue where the Menelin's on horseback in armor first time really leading an army and all they can think about is the fact that he has to really piss right now and he just wants to get off his horse and go. Fun fact, I was in the army, I have been in that situation where you're in full like kit, you're out in the field, you're having to do some dumb army stuff and the only thing you can really think of is like shit, I shouldn't have had that much water in the canteen, I really have to go and you're like sprinting towards whatever field goal you're doing or whatever like fake mission that we were going through in training and it's just like I would like nothing more than just to pee my pants right now, but I can't because I would get relentlessly made fun of if that happened. And this isn't like a series spoiler, but one of the coolest things going with the knowledge of the rest of the series is seeing how many little like plot seeds and like plot promises are given in this book that I know will pay off later on. So I mean, I won't spoil what they specifically are later in the video I will, but just seeing that even back in like book one and two that some of these threads were laid down that early and for the ability of writing to actually keep that congruence where you're not forgetting about these things and they're not just going to be like unthreaded threads that just get completely forgotten about is just really cool and just the fact that this is, is being done as like an indie author I have no idea what Terry's like editing process is if he's doing the Sanderson wiki if you know he just has a really good editor but just watching all that stay congruent and for the most part just put together it was just really cool to actually see. Opening up into some of the series spoilers and to talk a little bit more about those like plot threads and seeds that got planted you know seeing like Sherul start talking about the Alcar Lawn and the Medetta against them and knowing what that will expand out into having them bring up the Forsaken this early and just talk about like you know what they are and just sort of the mystery that is surrounding the Forsaken. Seeing some of the old characters and what some of these characters will be like those little like plot quirks and character flaws that they have and what they will eventually grow into. It was just really cool just to see like so many little tiny things that like get planted out and knowing that they will come to fruition later on. Early on there's mentions of like the valley people, you have these mentions of certain like magical things that would be possible, certain like things that could happen with the Molopov. You might not see some of these things actually resolve for like four to six books. They will get resolved which is just really cool and talks about just how expansive and congruent everything is. One of the coolest things I think to see was revisiting like Dunsalin and Isley. If you've read the series you know what that will spin into. I won't spoil anything. Having the last like image of I had with them is what they like turn into and instead like revisiting this back and seeing that you have those little character flaws and little hints that are laid out has been planned out is just absolutely mesmerizing. Like seeing like Isley and Dunslin and like how they are now, those little hints. I won't spoil anything for right now, but also as a side note, so one of the things I wanted to do while I was rereading this was to compile notes on the magic system because I thought it would be cool to like, let's do a deep dive into the Spellmonger magic system. I know there's enough little classification stuff there that there would be enough to make a video about. But what I didn't realize because I wasn't paying attention to it was if you had asked me before taking these notes and rereading the series and asked me if this system was like a hard magic system or a soft magic system, I would have told you it was hard. There's math involved, you have all these cool physical rules, it seems like the glyphs and everything is very well organized and like I guess that this was like a hard thing that you'd be able to quantify, classify and be able to like just truly understand. But as I started taking notes, I realized that, damn it, Terry, you tricked me. It's more of a soft magic system, but it's written in such a very well way that there's not enough actual detail in there to fully quantify it as a major magic system. Now, maybe all of this is written out and there are rules and this is completely a hard system, but revisiting some of the old books and looking on forums and trying to figure out if it wasn't just me, but if... I actually got duped. It turned out that, yeah, no, it seems to be pretty much a soft magic system. And, you know, hats off to you for being able to write such a compelling soft system where even I believe that it was a hard magic system to the point where I was like taking meticulous notes every time any magical lore or rune or thing was mentioned just so I could 
piece it all together, but just... But hey, I have already said I think you guys should read this series, so I am more than a little biased on this. I think the main criticisms stand if you don't like that type of exposition, or a first person, or the way that he tells the stories in the first book, then you're just gonna get more of that. But the world around it grows richer, and there's a lot that happens with the world that I think is like a major selling point. But if you hate the writing, you hate the writing. I have been neglecting two other books that I have been trying to review for more than a couple of months now that I thought I would be done with back in December, and I just a lot of stuff's been happening, a lot of craziness has been going on into my life. If you've noticed, I haven't quite hit that. I'm gonna post the three-day schedule, some two, some one, some three. Sometimes it's on a different date, but I'm still trying to dial everything in. I'm starting to get a little more organized, a little more systematic. I fully plan on starting the next book probably next week, and I would normally get these on Kindle just so I can read them faster and get these review out faster, but I really like the guy who does the audible narration. And I think that I've really associated his voice with Mendelin and it just adds so much to the experience for me that even though these are like 30 hour long audiobooks that I wouldn't want to do it without that just because I enjoy that part of the storytelling so much. But hopefully I have the book three of this reviewed next month. I mentioned earlier about the magic system. I don't know when that will actually be released because I know later on for some spoily spoilers that there are going to be multiple other magic systems that I will want to include with this and just do a breakdown since I'm not going into specific mechanics of the magic system. I can at least categorize everything and talk about that. Maybe I can do some like race videos too about like the different factions and different sort of species that are living on this world, but all future stuff. Just next book I'll try to review before the month is over. But anyway, thank y'all for stopping by and as always, take it easy.